Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians, where Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have learned while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. On today's episode, we speak with Dr. Diane Ansari Wynn, an anesthesiologist who suffered from burnout and managed to find her way out. She took that experience and turned it into a passion. And now she not only coaches physicians that are suffering from burnout, but she coaches physicians who want to coach other physicians. We discuss the importance of having a coach and why this is common in many other high-performing fields, but not in medicine, at least not yet. The function of a coach and tips for physicians who may be suffering from burnout or know someone who is. And I even got a bit of coaching myself during that interview. She even followed up with me the following day about what we discussed. This and all of my episodes are produced by Karen Gilfrey, professional voiceover artist. And she can be found at C-A-R-I-N-G-I-L-F-R-Y dot com. And now, Dr. Diane Ansari Wynn. Welcome back to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On today's episode, we have Dr. Diane Ansari Wynn, who's a very accomplished anesthesiologist who, after 15 years in practice, pivoted and is now a full-time physician coach. She not only coaches other physicians who may be experiencing the oh-so-common physician burnout, but now she's actually teaching coaches, teaching other physicians how to coach other physicians and extending herself in that way. So Dr. Ansari Wynn did her undergrad and medical school and MPH at the University of Michigan did her anesthesia residency at at Illinois Masonic, and then a fellowship at the University of Chicago in both cardiac and pain, and was then an anesthesiologist for 15 years in Denver, Colorado, before um, pivoting into coaching. She received her certificate in coactive coaching from the Coaches Training Institute, and is a graduate of the CTI's year-long leadership incubator, the Coactive Leadership Program. She is a physician development coach and currently started and is managing the Physician Vitality Institute in order to coach physicians through difficult times or even not so difficult times because kind of like therapy, it helps people that are living well to live even better. She's also the host of one of my favorite podcasts, the Doctor's Life Podcast, which serves our physician community in a similar way to this one in that we're both trying to help physicians to live their best lives. So Dr. Ansari Wynn, thank you so much for for taking the time out of your extremely busy schedule to come to to talk to me today about about coaching, the importance of coaching, how you got into coaching, and and what we can all learn from uh, someone who's studying coaching as much as you have. Well, thanks, Dr. Brad. It is great to be here this evening. Um, thanks so much for the invitation and the, that very warm introduction. Um, I just wanted to make a slight correction just so that um, so the folks in the audience kind of know what I'm doing. Um, I left, uh, or pivoted, as you said, um, I left clinical practice six years ago, and I actually started working in industry so I, um, my, I actually have two jobs. My day job is a medical director um, in industry. And then um, my passion project and the, the work that I do around that work, so read evenings and weekends, um, is, uh, is the coaching, the Physician Vitality Institute, the podcast. Um, so uh, just like all of you guys, um, You know, sometimes transitioning from non-clinical or clinical into non-clinical doesn't mean that you're less busy because we have our interests and the things that we love to do. And, um, you know, we're doctors, so we don't want to miss out. (laughs) So we try and do it all. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, that, uh, that mistake. Because oh, no as worries. prolific as you are, it seems like that is not a side gig. It seems like that is a full time job. Wow. Well, you know, it's a it's a um, a doctor's part time job, which is anybody else's full time job. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's how we roll. <laughs> so, so coaching. How how did you get into coaching? How did that become something that was even? Because a lot of us 
we don't even realize that a physician coach is, is a thing you hear about executive coaches and, but, but I, I, you know, it's, it's something that's, that most of us could probably, if not all of us could benefit from. So how did you discover that, that this was even a thing and then, and then get into it? Yeah. Well, you know, um, interestingly, physician coaching has become a lot more prevalent, which I'm so excited about. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, specifically a little bit more later, um, my role in in creating more physician coaches. Um, But how I got into uh, physician coaching was um, was probably about nine years ago uh, when I really started to feel like I was burning out, like I was not enjoying what I was doing. I was really feeling like um, it was, you know, it's really tough because I had been super high achiever as you, you know, you're so, you're so kind introduction. It's, you know, I went straight from, I graduated from high school at 16. I went to college at 16, straight into med school, um, you know, right into a very, you know, competitive residency. I was chief resident, um, married uh, someone that was in my medical school class, who was also, you know, super high priorities, um, pulmonary critical care, um, you know, went to Denver, private practice, had two kids and, you know, in the five, first five years did my practice and um, became partner, bought the house, the starter house, sold that one, got the the doctor house, you know, so just plugging along, being, you know, super high achiever. And then I just started feeling really tired. I started feeling fatigued. I started feeling trust, not trusting myself in my work, even though I was still doing very good work. You know, I was the kind of doc that um, I would get requests, you know, from the nurses and from other docs, if they wanted a family member to be cared for, or if they had a patient that needed TLC, they would look for me. Um, I did a lot of OB because I loved being with the patients, OB anesthesia, meaning um, I love being with the wake patients. I, you know, and uh, I was really good at my work, but I started to feel like I was sliding. And even though I wasn't, you know, on the outside, but on the inside, uh, I could definitely feel the signs of burnout coming on. And um, and so I was looking for help. And I was looking to talk to other another doctor about it. You know, um, I didn't really feel honestly. You know, I didn't feel so I could talk to my friends, my colleagues, most of my friends were surgeons, no offense, Dr. Brad, but you know, like you don't want to talk to other docs that are in your circle because the concern is that they're going to think that you are not that just you think you're sliding, but if you, you know, if you say that you might be feeling like you're not enjoying your work or you're, you're really tired or, you know, and it just doesn't sound like just, you know, the regular doc, doctor's lounge complaining that we do all the time, but you had an episode a little while ago um, that where you were discussing that with someone and they talked about just how frequent that is, that so many of us are experiencing those symptoms, mm-hmm. right? And if you were to, you know, reach across the drape, as it were, and try to discuss something like that with someone, it sounds like you'd be surprised how how often we're feeling like, that that being said, if you're anesthetizing one of my patients and you said, "Listen, Brad, I'm I'm really not feeling so into this right now," yeah. uh, you probably wouldn't no. get the best reaction. I'm uh, not feeling it. Yeah, and then <laughs> you know, let's, yes, exactly. Um, and then you have to keep in mind, you know, you're talking now. I'm talking nine years ago. Yeah. This is before Facebook, and they before LinkedIn, before Twitter. Um, before this sort of movement around physician burnout that's starting to come out, before all the research came out on physician burnout. So basically, you know, we we learned in med school and residency, like never show your weakness, never, never. And so for me to even say anything like that, I felt that was, um, would be, uh, it was scary to do. And so I was looking for a safe place to land a safe person to talk to. Yeah, and so you were living I, the dream. You had yeah. the house, you had the family, you had the job, you had the career, you had everything that we aspire to have. How dare you be unhappy? 
<laughs> right? That's what that comes down to. Well, it is that. And then also like, is she going to crack in the middle of a case and like, just leave the OR? Like, you know, like, could she be dangerous? Could she be, you know, could she be dangerous to me, my patients, you know? So that was the fear. Um, and it's still a fear, actually, if I, you know, when I talk to physicians that I coach, it's still a fear. Um, but anyway, I was looking for someone to speak with. I found uh, one physician coach. She had left uh, clinical medicine and she had learned coaching. And I found her. Um, and then as far as like other coaching, um, I actually started seeing a psychiatrist because I, I just thought there was something wrong with me. You know, if I'm, but I learned I was burned out. I was, I, there wasn't anything wrong with me specifically, except I was burned out. So, um, so I got into coaching because I was inspired by the coach that I was working with. And I thought, this is really cool. Like, you know, and I, I don't want to go back to residency and study psych. So <laughs> it's like, well, coaching sounds really great. And it's such a great community of supportive people, um, not just docs, but non-physicians. They are um, an amazing group of people and some of my best friends our, our coaches. I just love the coaching community. So, but I got into it because of my own need search and my own needs at that time. Mm -hmm. So we do have that movement that uh, is, is now prevalent. We're, we're all becoming more aware of physician burnout and, um, um, but the, the coaching, I still think is something that is very undervalued and underutilized in our industry, um, you know, executive, like I said, executive coaches, salespeople have coaches. Uh, it's very prevalent in, in so many industries, but we're all taught to be so self-sufficient, right? Don't show any signs of weakness because like we're, you know, you're at the top of your class. This is, this is who we are. This is what we do. You, you, you can't um, show any cracks in the armor. Um, right. But why do you why do you think clearly you think coaching is important and you'd be hard pressed to find someone that disagrees with it. But but why do you think we were so late to catch on? Do you think it's just this? It's in our culture. Yeah, I think I think that's the primary driver. Um, and as you are, you already pointed out, a lot of the reasons you know we self select into medicine. We're very driven group of people we're very resilient group of people self-sufficient and that is reinforced um, in how we learn medicine how we uh, communicate to each other um, as colleagues in medicine and um, I think also that we kind of can confuse um, the compartmentalization that um, that sort of is required of us to be professionals um, and we confuse that and just put put all of like the emotions and everything that we have when we're working we put them away um, and then sometimes forget that we need to like take them back out and process some you know if you if you and I were together in the OR and we had a difficult case um, you know where you're you at in at one point you're kind of you know, like, oh, holy crap, like what's going on? But then you switch into your doctor mode. And so you just, you know, and that's, that's the thing to do, you know, so that your emotions don't confound your actions. Um, so we do what we need to do. But then, you know, if, at least, you know, when I was in practice, like we might've gone like, whoo, that was a tough one. And they got, you know, just tuck them away in the unit or wherever. And then what will we do? Um, oh, oh, we're late. We better go, go do the next case. Like, we're not, you know, like, how did you feel? Wasn't that scary? Or like, we're not doing any of that. We're just, there's no decompression. No, there's no, no we're just, it's going on, on to, to the, the next, next thing. And then, um, and I think that's where um, we kind of take that for granted. Um, and then maybe, so we wouldn't take that time one, we may, we may be running late. So Maybe if it's lunchtime and we're running late for the next case, do we go eat? No, we're not going to eat. We go and start the next one. So like we're neglecting ourselves on multiple fronts um, in order to get the work done. And, um, 
And that's, that's laudable in its way, but it takes a toll. And ultimately, right, you get those signs of burnout and it, it can lead to apathy, which then ultimately affects patient care. And the reason that you're, you're skipping lunch is because you're trying to look out for the patient and the schedule and the other doctors, and you're trying to take care of other people. So ultimately, what you're trying to do is, ends up being self-destructive. So, so if you well said, well said, thank you. <laughs> so, so if you if you have someone like a, let's say you meet another doctor at a cocktail party, right? Okay. And you tell them that you're a physician coach, and they give you the incredulous look, right? Like, what is that? Who would <laughs> you do? Who would, who would need a coach? What, what's your, what's your spiel to use my East coast? <laughs> um, what's the, what's the spiel? Why, you know, how do you convince someone who, I guess, I guess we could start with how do you convince someone who, who comes to you feeling like they have a problem um, that the coach that the physician coach relationship is a valuable one and, and what a coach can do for them. And then I guess from there, we'll move on to, well, what about those skeptics that feel like, Oh, we don't need to, this is ridiculous. This is too woo woo. So, but yeah. let's start with someone that recognizes that they have a problem and they're, they're looking to you for help. How do you explain to them the role of a coach? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think the primary role of a physician coach, at least a peer physician coach, um, first and foremost, is to give, just like I was describing what I was looking for when I was burning out, is to give a doc a safe place to land and a safe place to talk about what's happening in their lives. Because in most of the time, they don't have that. They can't speak to their colleagues. They, um, not in a, in a way that they might, that they feel is completely safe and confidential all the time. Um, and then also, um, you know, a, a coach is trained to listen um, and to give feedback in a constructive way. Um, and then we also, if you think about it, you know, we have goals that are around our careers. Um, well, interestingly, like a lot of docs don't necessarily have goals around their careers. Like they go into practice and then their goal is to just practice as long as they can, um, unless you're in academics or something. But, you know, when you look at it, like when I ask people, like ask docs, like, do you have goals around your career or like, how do you want your career to fit into your life? How, what do you see yourself doing in 10, 15 years? And that's, you know, then their look kind of changed from like incredulousness to like, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, I had so, that moment yeah. when I started uh, when I started in practice because you know I went through the motions, college, medical school, residency, and then got my job. You know, and and then eventually would I'm I made partner, but like this is my office forever, right? <laughs> like unless I unless I move move jobs, and I I love my practice. I'm I, I'm I'm a, I'm a big believer in it. But I saw the chair, I saw the exam rooms, and then I saw the next 40 years. Like, this is what, this is it. This is, and then like, just, it just, because, you know, every, we work in, in our, through our stages, like I spent four years here and four years here and five years here. And then, and now 40, like, so yeah, that's an excellent, a big chunk. that's an excellent point, right? Like, is this, this is, and, and, and. For many people, that's totally fine. I mean, and for me, I have no intention of leaving, right? This, but I, to have a creative outlet, this is why I'm doing the podcast. Right. Well, that's the deal. It's, um, it, in addition to looking at like, where do you want your career? What do you want your career to look like? Right. So it can look like yours where you're practicing full time. You know, we just have more options now. Um, and then docs are also interested in talking to me because I have transitioned from not from clinical to non-clinical medicine, and I do have a lot of interests and pursuits. Um, so they want they want to know like how you know how did you do that? How can you do that? Um, and then look, so that's another category of people that speak to me. And then um, and then there's people who are they're kind of soul searching. They're looking for their next step. Uh, what they'd like to do next, or they're feeling tired and burned out, and they know that I've recovered from burnout, so they want to learn 
how they can either recover from burnout or, um, or, you know, prevent burnout from occurring. So, and, and just to be clear, you recovered from burnout while you were still practicing medicine and continued to, to practice clinical medicine, right? Cause you said it was nine years into practice. Well, I started burning out nine years into practice, but I, I left clinical medicine because of physician burnout. Yes. Oh, okay. I did. Yes. I didn't recover from burnout and then leave. Like I, I, you know, when people ask like, how, when did you burn out? It's like, well, when did it hit? I'm like, well, it probably started to really get kind of crispy about three years before I actually left. And, um, you know, I don't want to go into all the details. I actually did a podcast episode on on this um, not too long ago, but there's also another one called, um, what do we call it? Going to the dark side. I did about a year ago with one of the, another doc that went, he's, uh, he was a thoracic, cardiothoracic surgeon and um, NIH fellow. And he went in, into uh, doing clinical trials in industry. Um, so he's doing research still, but for industry and yeah, we call it going to the dark side. Oh, but so many people, uh, would, would, would salivate at just, you know, at the opportunity to do something like that. Right. 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 When, you know, again, like we're, we're talking contextually. So this, you know, when we made that transition, I was six years ago and I think he was like eight years ago, like even when I was thinking of leaving medicine and going to, into industry, that's what I got. You know, it's like, oh, so you're going to go to the dark side, huh? I was like, uh, yeah, I, I think I am. Um, so so about three years before I actually left is when I started realizing that I probably should consider an exit strategy, um, but I wasn't really sure. And that's when I started putting things into place um, slowly. But I started looking at, and I just, like I said, we did a whole episode on it, how to do it. But, you know, you start, need to start looking at your finances you're, you know, you need to start looking at, um, would you be willing to take a pay cut, um, looking at your overhead, your debts, your kids in private school, your nanny, you know, like all that stuff, you know, it's, if you're smart and you can do it, it's good to look at all of those things so that if you decide to leave clinical medicine, then it's not such a big, uh, leap or, um, a big impact because leaving medicine alone is a huge impact. It's a loss. You're going to feel grief around it. Um, even if you wanted to do it, I, I swear medicine was in my bones and I think it still is. Um, but it's, so it was one of the toughest things that I ever did, but it was not definitely necessary for me to do for my own, uh, well-being. Uh, it's just taking too much. Again, there's the cost, right? There's the, what you love to do. And then there's the cost that it takes to do it. So for some people that becomes out of balance and they, you know, it makes sense to cut back or transition. And for others, um, you can recover that it is possible to recover from burnout, stay in practice. Um, and I think maybe what we're, you're referring to is that I haven't had a single a client of mine leave practice. Yeah, <laughs> I I, I, yeah, that's the point I was trying to make. Is that I was I was trying I to use you as the example. <laughs> Clearly, not a great great example. I love um, my client, and she my client recovered so. <laughs> and practiced medicine for another six years. No, that is incorrect. But but you do coach people who then go on to stay in medicine. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. Okay, and okay. I love so, it. And I'm su I'm super happy about that work. Um, yeah, because I want to see docs. I want to see docs do the work that they love to do. I want to see them happy. I want to see them fulfilled and on purpose and on track. And um, so whatever that looks like for them is what they should be doing. So. so that the so we started this part of the conversation with how would you discuss what a coach does with a um, someone who recognizes the the benefits of coaching. Now, how would you respond to a coach skeptic? And that that answer might be, well, I wouldn't, and that's totally fine. But but how would you start convincing someone who's skeptical about the benefits of a physician coach or even the role of a, of a physician coach? Right, knowing yeah. what, knowing what physicians are like. Right. Well, you know, I think, and it's not that it's like 
the skeptic at the cocktail party, this is an ongoing discussion in our physician community. You know, when you start looking at the reasons why docs burn out, right? Because there's there's three components to it. There's an individual component, organizational component, and a cultural component. They all contribute to physician burnout. So some people say that, you know, docs, docs don't burn out because of themselves. They burn out because the system sucks. And it's like, yes, the system does suck. Um, and uh, what I do is to help docs that are still, you know, working within the system to do what they can for themselves, including advocating for themselves um, so that they can, you know, have the best career that they want to within the system. So I think what I, you know, for a skeptic that's like, because I've had skeptics come and talk to me, they're like, well, what's the difference between you and a friend or you and a therapist? And I will just say that the difference between a coach and a friend is that a coach is um, completely and totally invested in your agenda and your goals. They don't have, you know, the agenda of a friend and they don't, and they, whatever wacky, crazy goals you think you might have, the coach is going to help you achieve them. And then, um, and coaching is not therapy, although there is a lot of process um, in coaching. You know, if you come and you talk about your feelings and you talk about your fears and you talk about your big dreams, that's process work. And so that, but that is not therapy. Um, the nice thing though about a physician coach is that they can, they can kind of see maybe a little more readily than someone that's just like a plain old life coach, um, that you might need therapy or that you might be depressed. Um, and then, and refer you, you know, to the proper person, you know, it might be, and I, you know, I talk about this when I talk to docs about recovery, you know, one of those pieces is to make sure that you're in good physical health. So if you come to me and you, you tell me that you're tired all the time, you know, I'm like, when's the last time you saw your family doc? Have you seen him in the last year? You know, you might have a medical condition that has gone undiagnosed, you know, because you haven't been caring for yourself as well. And, you know, we, a lot of docs don't go see a, a physician regularly for checkups. I'm, you know, I'm in that number. I, you know, I went not long ago, but it'd been a couple of years uh, before that, I must admit. So, um, so that I think in that way, a physician coach is a little bit more adept in making sure that you, we still keep the eye on the ball in terms of looking at your, um, your health, but, but coaches look at your entire life. Um, they look at not just your career and your goals, but we help you look at what's happening in your family, what's happening with your finances, what's happening, um, you know, your mindset in terms of, you know, do you feel like you uh, can't leave medicine because you don't deserve to leave medicine? You know, there's just a lot of factors involved. Um, but I would say that the thing about a coach, um, physician coaches, they get it. They have been through it. Um, so they're unlike any other kind of coach in that respect. Um, you know, when you, when you use acronyms, when you refer to your medical education, uh, when you talk about getting pimp dry, when you talk about staying up for 36 hours, you know, we get it. We get it. Uh, whereas, you just, so you don't have to explain that safety, uh, that camaraderie, it, it's right there for you. So, and it's so, I'm like, well, if somebody doesn't want that, then that's, that's all good. <laughs> that was an excellent sales pitch. <laughs> How could you not like that? It's like not liking pizza. Who doesn't like pizza? <laughs> we could have a debate about Chicago versus New York. But oh well, yeah, yeah. Can I just tell you on the DL, I love Chicago. I mean, I love the New York pizza. I love folding it. I love <laughs> right, not with a knife and fork, right? You got to fold. No, it. it's like I love the big slice and folding oh, yeah. it in half. And yeah, I love New York pizza actually. We we call the we we're um, my husband ex husband's family's from uh, from New York and so we call Chicago pizza cheese pie. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of dough. <laughs> There's yeah a lot of cheese. It's dough filled with cheese. Yes. 
Um, so, so you, you started the physician vitality Institute, correct? That's yours. That's yours. Yes. Right? And, yes. and you have your five step system, uh, that you go through with people when you're coaching them. So can we go I through do. those, those five steps? Yeah. And we'll just talk about some of the common issues that you see and how you help people to address those issues. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll be happy to. I'll go through them briefly. And, and um, I'll also say too that um, I'm excited to announce, I think this is the first time I've announced it on a podcast, that um, I've actually uh, wrote up my system and um, so as a book. And that is going to be, yeah, I'll talk about a busy person. Like, you want something done? Ask a busy person. So that's going to be released on January 2nd. Um, and wow, it's, a, yeah, it's a called- book. Yeah, it's called Dr. Yep. Heal That Thyself, A Physician's Guide to Health and Wellness. Um, so that'll be released Excellent. January second. Yep. Thank you. So um, so just briefly, um, what I talk to docs about is this first principle is energy management. So looking at things in terms, looking at your life and your actions and the things that you do in terms of energy, meaning things that energize you and things that deplete you, not just in terms of tasks, right? So like you have, say you have surgery, right? And if you know, it's going to be a long surgery, but it's like you geek out. It's like your favorite surgery. You love it. You know, so when you come out of that six hour case, in some ways you're tired just because of the, uh, the time that you spent, but like, because it was so fulfilling to you, how do you feel at the end? You actually feel energized. Like, or imagine like having to spend like six hours studying for boards, <laughs> yeah, same six hours, right? How do you feel after that? Probably depleted is my guess. That's, that's how I would feel. Yeah, so, I, yeah. so you can spend the same amount of time doing a task that like energizes you or depletes you. So just keep that in mind as you're, you know, you know, if you learn, take nothing else from this, start thinking about energy management as opposed to like your task management. Um, Because it may be things that you think you enjoy because you should enjoy them. So you've convinced yourself that you enjoy them, but in fact, you don't. So they're they're depleting you without you recognizing it because they're the things that you're supposed to like. Right. And it kind of unhinges the ideas like between work and play. Like some people go to work and they're like, well, I can't wait until I finish work so that I can go like, play with my family, whatever. And then, you know, you can feel kind of guilty because like childcare or in housework and stuff like that, you know, may, may have some, you know, may feel good in some ways, but in some ways it's hard work and it can be depleting. So it just takes away those labels of like, what is work and play? It's okay to, it's okay if your work energizes you. It's okay if, you know, housework depletes you. And kind of knowing those things will help you when you're trying to figure out where you need help um, because you're looking for more of the activities that are going to energize you or at least um, put them in a sequence where you're not like doing all the depleting tasks together, all the energizing tasks together. Um, So, you know, in some ways that's why like if you schedule things and you're like, I can't wait till I go on vacation and then you do a vacation that is, it's fun, but it's also can be like, you know, taxing, like, you know, like I'm, I live in Colorado for 15 years, right? So, you know, people would come from Texas, they'd go skiing and they would have a great time, but, you know, it's like sometimes it's not as relaxing as it would have been to choose something else. Like, so you kind of look at the, you know, what was the purpose of the vacation? It was like to relax, would you renew, rejuvenate? So you have to learn, you know, it's like Dr. Hill and myself, you need to learn, you know, who you are and, you know, what, what does energize you? What does deplete you? And it's different for different people. So that's the first thing just to keep in mind. So um, that's what I, I start to teach docs. And another thing that I, I want to really emphasize is that um, it's really important to care for yourself and to make yourself a priority in your life. And I know, um, particularly for um, docs that have you know, work and kids and family responsibilities that that can really fall by the wayside. 
but it is so true that like if you cannot have the capacity to do everything that you need to do, especially at such a high level, if you don't take good care of yourself. And so it's not selfish and it's not rude and it's not me. Like it's just something that you need to do so that you can be at your best self. So those are the two things I kind of want people to be thinking about. Um, and then I teach more specific strategies about how to renew your energy in different ways. So, um, and the whole system is called the physician vitality system, like based on the physician vitality Institute. So things that, um, energize us connecting with others. Um, so there's, I teach some, you know, a module on that. There's a chapter on that in the book. Um, so not, so friends, family, colleagues, you know, maybe, and just how, and I teach ways to, to do that, how to make better connections. Um, and then um, inspiration. So connecting with things that inspire you. Um, it doesn't matter, like, you know, whether it doesn't have to be like traditional spiritual practices, um, but even like walking outside in nature, meditation, um, looking at a picture of your kids, like things that get to your heart. What makes your heart feel glad? That's inspiration. Um, then the other thing that I teach docs are calming techniques. Um, so things that you can, where you can help you to calm your mind so that you have relaxed um, and focused um, thought like during your day and then how to recover from your, your day. So um, simple practices that will help you give you more energy during your work day and then also help to energize to, you know, before and at the end of your work day. Um, then I also teach about caring for your body. So again, you know, like getting that checkup, getting the exercise, eating meals. I mean, these are like simple things sometimes, but docs, we just, we are just, you know, yep. we're, we're just power through. We just yep. power through. Uh, my my um, schedule was packed. Uh, I didn't did you eat dinner. Did you eat lunch today, doctor? I, did you eat dinner today? Doctor? Actually, uh, <laughs> my wife is not going to appreciate this because she gets mad when I skip meals, but no, not lunch. <laughs> and then by the time I finished seeing all my patients and made all my phone calls, it was time for this interview. So not oh, lunch, nor dinner. Yes. There you yeah. are, doctor, doctor. And that's the thing is there's, this is there's this chest thumping um, mentality in medicine that like I got two hours of sleep last night and I'm just going to power through because I'm the toughest guy. And I, you know what, I just sucked it up and I didn't need anything today because I just took care of patients because I'm this martyr. Right. Like, yeah, I could have made my schedule a little lighter and, uh, yeah, and actually, right. <laughs> actually eat lunch or it would end up Really, it would have served my patients better had I stopped for lunch and taken a walk around the block outside, right? Cleared my head, re reset me a little bit, right? That sounds like what you're saying, right? Just that take exactly that extra time, maybe think. block off a couple spots, take a walk around the block, and then my afternoon patients will be better served by me having having done that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yep. And last but not least, emotional fitness. So being aware of our thoughts, um, particularly our negative thoughts and how to recognize them and how to turn them around, um, as best we can. Um, and it, that's, it's just simple, simple, um, you know, it's old, good old fashioned, uh, operant conditioning, basically recognize the thought, uh, you know, let it uh, identify it, recognize it and see like how it's, how it shows up in your body or how it's showing up and then uh, ways to, um, to switch those, let those negative thoughts go away because those uh, in and of themselves, not only are they obviously their negative thoughts, who wants to feel negative, but you know, those get passed on to family, friends, colleagues, patients, and turn on yourself. Um, so being emotionally fit is uh, the last of the the five like major components of the system. But I think if you're you know take the one thing away like you're saying you know just ask yourself is it like is what'll really happen if I take ten minutes to eat and you know go to the restroom like like what'll really happen 
you know, what, like how much better could it be if I know like I'm going to be late seeing patients and I take two minutes and I send a text to my wife or call my wife or husband and just say, hey, I was thinking about you. I'm going to be late. Whatever. Like that's the connection to others. Oh, yeah. But in it, when you're. When you're seeing patients in the office, what what happens is that that snowballs, right? You start seeing patients late, and then that puts you further behind. And then then you, with the next patient, you have to apologize, and that takes like a, a minute. And then that adds to your, and then by the end of the day, you're running like an hour behind, and nothing. Few things stress me out more than seeing a whole bunch of patients that are waiting for me. So yeah, that's how yeah. I keep my stress level to a minimum is by actually skipping like taking my time with my patients, using my lunchtime to catch up and then well, uh, starting on time. So, but I should just make, well, not to, turn this into, lunch. not to turn this into a coaching session, but yeah. you could find a way, you know, to eat the meal still. Cause you didn't, you like, you didn't have to, you know, like how could yeah. I get a meal? Cause the whole purpose is just to get food in. So yeah. how could I get the meal in? And like, does it have to be all or nothing? So yeah. does it have to be the whole 20 minutes or could it be five minutes? couple bites. Can I, yeah. Can I take, um, you know, in order to like get my stress level down, um, could I, before I go into the next patient's room, uh, take five deep breaths and just center myself Yeah. and, and get rid myself of the negative thoughts of that somehow being a, um, being late equates with your value as a physician or as a husband or whatever. And, you know, like I'm always like back it up to the present moment, just back it up. So take those couple of deep breaths and walk in and like, you know, I'm Dr. Brad. I'm so glad you're here. Let's, what can I do for you? Be present for them. They won't care. Like it'll, that you're worth five minutes. Like you're there for them. And not like rushed, they won't care. Believe me, I've been on both sides of it. These these were two lessons that you said were actually in previous episodes. Episode four, the uh, where I had a patient experience representative. One of his big tips was before each visit, stop, take a breath, and then open the door and see the next patient. That there you was the same thing. <laughs> And then um, a, a show that hasn't been published at the time that we're recording this was with um, uh, Dr. Stephanie Sog, who's a PhD uh, in psychology, and she uh, works at the Harvard Weight Management Center. And we talked about how to talk to people about that are having issues with their weight about that issue. And what she was one of the things she talked about was their negative self-talk. So if you catch people having these, oh, I'm so stupid. Oh, I'm so, right? Make them recognize that they're saying it and point out how destructive it can be. So the same thing applies to us. You have these negative thoughts. If you, I think the saying is, if you if if you talk to your friends the way the thoughts in your head talk to you, you wouldn't have any friends. So recognizing that you have these thoughts that are devaluing you and 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 helping to turn those around. Absolutely. Um, you guys can't see, but uh, Dr. Brad and I are on Zoom and I am just like nodding my head like a bobblehead at all the things that he's saying. I'm trying not to interrupt, but I have the hugest grin on my face and just smiling and nodding in acknowledgement. You are on the money, Dr. Brad. I so appreciate that. <laughs> Applying it is a different... Uh, yes. Hearing yes. it oh, now that I'm hearing it again, um, it'll uh, hopefully it'll help me to... <laughs> And then, you know, this is obviously, I'm not recording this just for me. Um, <laughs> it's, it's it's for the listeners as well. Um, I, I think we're running short, short on time, but yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. So I'm, I'm hoping you can stay on just a little longer. Um, and just mention if you have some, some of the issues that you see that have relatively simple ways to correct them. So when you're coach of your coaching clients, you probably see some common threads. So if you could just mention one or two things that have relatively simple solutions, um, what, what would those be? Well, I would say that, you know, one of the things is that we've already talked about it. So I'm not going to like go into like a whole another, 
you know, discussion. Um, but I think that that a lot of docs come in and they feel as though they aren't valued. Um, they are they are working hard and they're doing their work and they're feeling undervalued and misunderstood. And so, um, so I think one of the things to help to ameliorate that is to um, do just a simple practice. Um, when you get home at night or before you leave, just write down um, three wins for the day, three things that you did good at um, related to your work or some, the way you communicated with someone or whatever it is, three wins. Just so that's one thing you can do. Um, you know, just this is simple. Since yes, we're simple, they'll just give you simple structures. Um, the other thing is that um, doctors uh, often feel like disconnected and they feel lonely. Um, you know, interestingly, uh, in part, I think because we do have to uh, assume the role of superhero, um, superhuman, even though we're uh, just simply human and we have a special skill set. Um, we always a very special skill set and we are special people. I'm not going to deny it. Like we're, like I said before, I think doctors are awesome. We're resilient. We're bright. We're motivated. Uh, we want to give to the world and it, you know, and you know, I've, I've, so I've, I've given you four wins right there, like just who you are. Um, so just keep, keep that in mind that, um, that you are doing this superhuman special work, um, but that you are, you know, simply human and it's okay to have needs, wants, desires, hunger, thirst. <laughs> Bathroom break. <laughs> Bathroom breaks. It's all, it's okay. And I think that as slowly but surely, uh, we're gonna change the culture, you know, of medicine as we go through. And, um, and we'll be more supportive of each other. You know, it's like you said, executives have coaches, therapists have groups. They, why? Because they know that their work is hard. So they talk to each other about their work. Why? So that they continue, can continue to do their work at a high level. So, you know, take a page out of their playbook. It's, it's not an admission of weakness to just admit that you have, you have needs, human needs. So if, if someone wants to take a deeper dive into this, where there are a multitude of places where people can find you, where, where can people find you? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, you can find me on all social media at uh, Dr. Diane MD. So, you know, I'm not going to run through all the social media, but you can find me there. Um, you can find me on my website, uh, www.drdiane.com. And that will tell you more about me. It also gives you links over to the Physician Vitality Institute. You can listen to the Doctor's Life podcast um, through that website. And then you can also find out about the, if you're more interested in helping other docs and becoming a physician coach. Um, I've actually launched uh, a training program for doctors. It's running its first session now this fall, and we are we're already enrolling for a second session that's starting on October 15th. Um, so it's called the Physicians Coaching Academy, and in three months you can learn how to become have coaching conversations with other physicians. Um, and so I have a you know docs in that group that want to be coaches. I have docs in that group. I have one doc that's, for example, she's a residency program director. She has doctors coming to her already for advice. She wants to know how to have coaching conversations with them. So, um, so come one, come all, uh, www.drdiane.com. Find out more about that. Send me a note uh, through that website. Um, check things out. I'm just here to support and um, and help and and uh, grow this wonderful community. Just trying to help docs heal the world. It's my mission. So, and that and me, plug that book. That. Plug that book one more time. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh doc, the, the book is entitled "Doctor Heal Thyself." So that's easy to remember. Um, and that will be released on January 2nd. 
Um, so we'll have a, you know, some more information about that as it comes closer to, to launch. But. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you with all these different things that you're juggling, taking the time to, to have this conversation with me and, uh, and to be on the podcast and for all the great you're doing, all the great work that you're doing with and for the, the physician community and the house of medicine. It's, it is, it is, it is desperately needed and much appreciated. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. It is, it really has been my pleasure to speak with you this evening and I, I can't wait to let you go so you can go eat. <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> ah, Dr. Maybe some, some Halloween candy. <laughs> oh, there you go. I thought that was the breakfast of champions. The breakfast, yeah. Well, it's a, it's, it's bookending, bookending. The breakfast, right, right, right. Yeah, start the day off with graham crackers and juice. That you used to exactly the doctors' nurses station. Exactly, that's something only only doctors will will understand. Graham crackers, cranberry, apple, and uh, ginger ale. That's the meal. <laughs> we'll go have some of that. All right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Find all previous episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, and write us a review. You can also visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash physician's guide to doctoring. If you are interested in being a guest or have a question for a prior guest, send a message or post a comment.